So far, so good. Is there any other evidence for this idea that it's an early sensory process? Well, one of the things we found, other than the contrast effect and the pop-out effect, and this hadn't been done in the 100 years since the phenomenon had been discovered. It's pretty straightforward. Instead of showing a five, which is, uh, 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 you know, uh, numeral five, a grapheme, what if instead of showing an Arabic five, I should really say Indian five because that's where they come from, but let's call them Arabic five. Instead of showing them an Arabic five, supposing you show them a Roman five, what would happen? The answer is clear in all of them. They said, well, we see the five, but there's no color. This is important because the fusiform gyrus encodes a visual shape, not the high-level concept of five, which we think is happening higher up in the brain. In a, okay, that's just another diagram. In a region in the vicinity of the angular gyrus near the TPO junction, that's where abstract numerical concepts are represented. And that's damage. You can no longer do simple arithmetic. Okay? So, so you got this. What, any other evidence for synesthesia being a sensory phenomenon, at least in these subjects we had identified? Here's a striking piece of evidence. What you find is we actually stumbled on a patient, or I should say a subject, who was a colorblind synesthete. Now, how is that possible? It sounds like an oxymoron. Okay? Well, it turns out he had peripheral color blindness in the sense he didn't have the full complement of cone pigments in his eye, so only had a limited range of colors. But when he looked at numbers, he would see colors which he said looked like Martian colors, which you could never see in the real world. Right? And he said, I can't see any of these colors in objects or in the real world, but when I see numbers, I see these weird colors. Now, why would this happen? It happens, I think, it fits my theory beautifully, because the receptors are missing or deficient in the eye, he can't see the colors in the world, but V4, the color area, is still completely intact in the brain. So what you're doing by showing numbers is activating the number neuron and cross-activating the color neuron in the brain and creating colors which you can never see in the real world because of the deficiency in the cone pigments. This immediately rules out any high-level association theory, by the way, because you cannot see a color which you've never seen before. You can't, uh, you can't form a memory of a color which you've never seen before. Okay, now this is all true, by the way. Um, first of all, we did brain imaging studies, we meaning Ed Hubbard, Geoff Boynton, and I, where we went and showed normal people numbers. Of course, the number area lights up, that red circle. If you show it to a number color synesthetes, the number area and color area light up. This was published in Neuron a few years ago. Even more intriguing, there was a recent study about six months ago where somebody did DT, diffusion tensor imaging, where you can actually see white matter the fibers connecting areas, and found in these synesthetes there was an actual increase in cross-wiring between these areas. So directly confirming our hypothesis. Now all of this is fine, and it was true for the first two or three synesthetes we studied, and it was very fortunate. Then we ran across synesthetes where this wasn't entirely true. It wasn't just the Arabic number, but the Roman number fight. It looked like the numerical concept evoked the color, not just the visual appearance. In fact, they would say things like, Monday is blue, Tuesday is green, Thursday is, is, is yellow. Days of the week were colored. Months of the year were colored. February is green. March is chartreuse. April is indigo. Right? No wonder people thought they were crazy. What do you mean April is indigo? Right? But remember the golden rule, if you, especially if you're in neurology, if somebody sounds crazy, usually means that you are not smart enough to figure it out. Of course, sometimes they are crazy, but... Generally, it means you don't know what's going on. Okay, what do uh, days of the month, months of the year, and numbers have in common? Numerical sequence or ordinality. Where might that be represented in the brain? I'd like to suggest that probably is in the, in the vicinity of the angular gyrus, where we know numerical computation takes place. There's an ab abstract representation of numerical sequence in that region of the brain. And, not, and then it turns out that the higher color area to which V4 projects is also in that general vicinity. So if that cross-wiring gene is expressed selectively in the fusiform, you get number color synesthesia, the lower synesthetes who are driven by the visual appearance of the number. If it's expressed higher up in the vicinity of the angular gyrus, you get the higher synesthetes where there's a numerical concept that drives the appearance of the color. You get lower synesthetes and higher synesthetes. Now comes an interesting question. Okay, now comes an interesting question. What if the same gene, instead of being expressed in the fusiform or in the TPO junction, is expressed throughout the brain? 
Well, I'll tell you the answer. Remember, I started with the point made about Galton, and I said it's been known for 100 years, or at least 50 years, that synesthesia is about eight times more common in artists, poets, and novelists than in the general population. So what are artists, poets, and novelists good at? They're good at metaphor, linking seemingly unrelated ideas, as when you say, it is the east and Juliet is the sun. Well, you don't say Juliet is the sun. Does that mean she's a glowing ball of fire? Actually, schizophrenics do that, but that's a whole another story, right? Normal people say, no, she's radiant like the sun. She's nurturing like the sun. She's warm like the sun. She rises in the east, uh, rises in bed like the sun rises in the east. Whatever connections your brain wants to make. And, of course, uh, Shakespeare was a master at this. So what I'm arguing is a shamelessly phrenological account of creativity and metaphor. If that same gene is expressed throughout the brain, and if you believe that concepts are also anchored in different regions of the brain, greater cross-wiring or cross-activation is going to increase the propensity to link seemingly unrelated ideas and thereby increasing your ability to form metaphors, right? And hence, the eight times more higher incidence of synesthesia in artists, poets, and novelists. In other words, what I'm saying is the synesthesia gene, why is it so prevalent? Why do you see one in 30 people having this quirk of seeing colored numbers? Natural selection would have eliminated this thousands of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Why do you have it? It's completely useless. You have it because there's a hidden agenda. In other words, it makes certain outliers in population more metaphorical, more creative, artsy, whatever, right? Now, people always ask, so it's like the sickle cell gene. There is a hidden agenda for the, for the synesthesia gene. So people ask me, if it's that good, how come we don't all have it? Now, that's a silly question. If we don't all have it because we have, evolution takes time. Maybe given another 100,000 years, we'll all have it. Another reason, which I think is the real reason, is you don't want everybody to be creative. You want genetic diversity. You don't want everybody to be creative and metaphorical. If a neurosurgeon is doing surgery on your brain, you don't want him getting creative on you, right? So it's good to have some very non-creative types and creative types in the population preserving this genetic heterogeneity. Okay. Now, um, I told you about the Martian color effect in colorblind people, um, colorblind synesthetes. Now, I want to say that even though this is a sensory phenomenon, I don't want you to go away thinking that's all there is to it. Uh, remember, I told you lower synesthetes, higher synesthetes driven by the concept of the number, lower synesthetes uh, driven by the visual appearance. You can make a big five out of threes. What happens then? It's very interesting. If the person changes his zoom lens, looks at the trees, the, the trees rather than the forest, he says green. When he sees it as a gestalt, as a five, he says, oh, it changes. It becomes red. So this shows top-down activation of the grapheme node can in indirectly influence the color that is evoked. Okay, now another peculiar form of synesthesia, which I'll tell you about, was discovered also by Galton. He pointed out if you take people in the population, often the same people who have synesthesia, but sometimes not, and you ask them to imagine numbers, they'll say, oh, I can imagine numbers. Where are the numbers? He'll say one is here, two is here, three is here, four is here, five is here, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and he'll draw an elaborate virtual line in space, convoluted, something, sometimes doubling back in itself. And this was called number forms or number lines by Galton. And of course, everybody ignored it. People said, for 100 years, people said, well, it exists, but who knows what to make of it. Maybe they're just making it up. So again, we have to show this is a real phenomenon. By the way, it sort of reminds you of people like Einstein and other mathematicians saying that they have numerical landscapes in the brain. It numbers are spatially represented, and they wander these landscapes to discover hidden relationships. Well, is this mumbo jumbo, or can you study it scientifically? Well, these patients, these not patients, these people, allow you to approach this problem scientifically. The first thing we did was to show that it's real. How do you do that? Well, there's a famous effect called a number distance effect, which you can try on normal people. We all have a vague number line of sorts, because numbers begin to the left, one, two, three, four, and they sort of, but you don't, you can see one here if I want to, okay? There's no compulsion that you have to see it here. But you have a vague number line. If you give a person two numbers, five and six, which is bigger? Six, okay, he's a bit slow today, but six. Which is bigger, 19 or 2? 19. <laughs> okay. So generally, if you do this systematically, what you find is the further apart two numbers are, the quicker the answer and more accurate. If they're close together, people are slow. He was slow, as you notice. Okay? Now, why is that? If it's just a lookup table, it shouldn't matter how far apart the numbers are. So the suggestion was there's a scalar representation of numbers somewhere in the brain, and if they're close together, it's easier to confuse them, and that's why you confuse them and you take a longer time. 